again. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have an incredibly important topic with a great number of people with a lot of ideas. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. For a few weeks now, the world has been convulsed with chat GPT. People have been trying it out. People have been asking it questions. People have been thinking about it, trying to figure out what it means. And the answers to what it means are all over the place. People think it may be the apocalypse for higher education that may kill writing as we know it and allied to uh, AI technologies and other fields like music and visuals. It may mean the end of human creativity. Another extreme says that it's actually not a big deal. That it's not very good. It's easily controllable and we can just basically absorb it into our normal educational activities. Others see all kinds of angles and challenges. What is, how does copyright apply to it? What does it mean to write something like that? What does it do to the human voice? What are the many pedagogical responses? What are the institutional responses? What does this mean for Google search enterprise and more? Now, last week we had a conversation about this that was a rip roaring hour, this nonstop question. And we have questions left over from it, in fact. We had a whole bunch of ideas and the topic is so good, we're returning to it right now. Now, what I'd like to do for the next, right now, for the next hour of conversation is I'd like to invite you to share your comments and thoughts. And I'm going to bring up to the stage people who are invested in this, people who are expert in different parts of it, from computer science to media studies to writing pedagogy to economics. And I'd like to have a conversation rolling about that. So if you'd like to join us on stage, again, just press the raised hand button, easy to bring you right up. If you have questions or comments, please just use the Q&A box, um, and we're happy to host you. Um, in fact, before I can say anything, already hands have gone up and questions have gone up, and I have to follow a long tradition of the Future Transform, which is to bring up on stage somebody who has a good beard. So without uh, any, uh, any hesitation, hello, Barry Burkett. Hey, guys. How's everyone doing this morning? Or I guess Great. afternoon now. Well, if it's morning, you must be in the Midwest or the West somewhere. Uh, I'm right outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm on ah, the Kentucky okay. side of the Ohio River. Yeah. Okay. Are you are you being scoured by wind? Are you being flensed by snow and ice? Well, uh, we've been getting some some more gray weather this morning. It's supposed to be wet tonight, and then it's supposed to be freezing overnight into those negative digits we've all been seeing inside uh, the inside uh, the, uh, news reports recently. Load up on supplies and be safe. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So what, what do you think, Barry? What's your take on, G on ChatGPT? You have an unusual perspective. Yeah. So I think that ChatGPT, so, so everybody, my name's Barry. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a startup called Sakane. Um, our first product, we are working to stop ghostwriting inside of academia. And so that, that's my perception of it. My perception of it is that ChatGPT is no different or can be no different than somebody using an essay mill. It's just we've just used AI to help to help stop that. Mm -hmm. So that is my central point of view. And so in that, I think that 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 AI can be doing two things, right? Similar to what people were saying last week, it can be like a calculator that can really help, you know, it can really disrupt a student's education when learning their math facts and deploying their math facts in the class. But it can also be one of these things that can kind of take the first pass at something and help somebody understand their argument better that they can then improve upon as they want to be improving upon their writing. Um, and I think that comes down to the creativity of the administration and the instructor and to be developing that, that, that relationship, right, with the students, because mm -hmm. one of the central arguments of catching ghostwriters is that, is that you need to be looking at how students communicate with you anyways, and then compare that to what they're submitting and see how those two things work together. Interesting point. Um, so for you, this is this is you're the opposite of the apocalyptic school of thought. Um, you're saying this is something that we already know how to control and to handle pretty effectively. I, I think. Well, so so research, right? So so again, my my bend is in academic integrity. My bend is in stopping ghostwriting. Right. A lot of research has been saying that the best thing to do is to be interviewing your students, right, for your instructors to be cross questioning a student. And I forget who I forget who the gentleman was on that you had last week who who taught writing to his classes. He's like, you know, in theory, everybody has a class of 15 students. And if I had a class of 15 students, I could teach everybody in that class how to be writing. It'd be fine. But I've not had that. My lowest class has been 65 students. Whoa. When you have, well, that was that was one of the panelists that you had last week. That's John. Yeah. 
Right. So, so I mean, 60, that was the lowest class he had and upwards of 125. If you have one instructor, even one instructor with a TA population able to assist, that becomes a very burdensome task to be cross-questioning each student about what they wrote before you even get into grading their writing ability and talking about their semantics and stuff. And so that, that was the lift that, that we saw. We wanted to follow that line of, of research saying, let's yeah. get more cross-questioning and talking with our students more. We felt that that was more appropriate with that academic honesty and integrity statement, like that mm -hmm. the, the, tr the trust that we try and give, like you, the student, are going to give me your best, and me, the scholar, I'm going to give you my best. We wanted that mm -hmm. collaborative relationship. Um, and we felt that things like stylometrics, well, well, we've seen that stylometrics are not panning out that use of judging metadata. Um, it's not been, I think we're continuing to see iterations on that. And then, and then there are also, um, there's some really cool technologies that are being developed where people are able to use add-ons inside of Microsoft Word to be able to see when students work, how they work, where they're working from, that kind of stuff, which mm -hmm. blends the dynamic between, okay, I don't have a camera in front of you, mm -hmm. but it's still a little bit big brother with saying, mm -hmm. Is this your IP address? How long have you been working on this? And what? So partly it's a technological answer, but it's also partly about improving the relationship between instructor and students. One hundred percent, yes. That that would be my point of view. Barry, can can I keep you on stage for a few minutes? Sure. Because so we have a whole horde of people, and I want to I want to join the I want and uh, and you know those who are not white guys with beards, I think are fully welcome. So let me, let me make sure we get as many of them as possible. Um, oops, hang on a second. So let me welcome uh, Carolyn Coward, who has one of the best jobs in the United States, a librarian at JPL. Hello, Carolyn. How's my sound, Brian? It's pretty good. Your your video okay. your video looks a little choppy, but uh, we can see you and we can hear well, you. Well, su such is my life lately. Um, thank you for inviting me up. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm. I would like to add to this conversation. I'd like to dial this back a couple of layers, and mm -hmm. I apologize. I was not on last week but i'd like to talk about the ai systems themselves mm -hmm. um i'm involved with uh the nasa effort to establish guidelines practice and eventually policy around ethical and responsible ai and what that means to nasa is we we delineate uh, ethical versus responsible. Ethical has to do with the actual wrenching under the hood, the actual systems mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. Is there inherent bias in the system? Is there junk code or programming? We want to make sure that the systems we develop are the highest possible quality with the least amount of bias so that as the AI starts learning from itself, it doesn't drive itself off the rails. Mm -hmm. So that's ethical AI. Responsible AI is a much broader concept where you took at, look, take a look at uh, the structure, the people involved, the organization, how ethical, responsible, uh, equitable, uh, in, in, uh, inclusive, how all of those factors for who is building the system. So responsible AI takes a much more global worldview about artificial intelligence. Oh, that was weird. I just yeah. had some strange sounds in my ear. Oh, there was just a there's just a brief silence, you know, like a, like okay. you, but you're sleeping. I'm not a robot, I promise. Well, we'll, we'll check. Today, okay. anyway. Yeah, that remains to be seen. Anyway, so we're at NASA. We're working on both ethical and responsible AI. And when chat GB, GPT came up, I have to admit, so I've been a librarian for 30 years. I've seen all the technological developments from the card catalog to OPACs to databases to, we all remember, zip disks. Uh, to what we have, yeah, it, the beginnings of the internet, basic HTML, web 2.0, web 3.0. So I've seen all the changes and I love all the changes, but the fact is I'm actually a bit of a Luddite. I'm a bit of a, like a skeptic. I'm looking at AI with a real kind of a jaundiced eye and a hmm, wait and see attitude. Heck, we just bought a new microwave oven two weeks ago, and I got nervous because it didn't have a keypad on it. It's got this slidey thing, and I'm still kind of getting used to that. So I look at technology in general 
as okay, let's wait and see. Let's see if this is good for the library environment with connecting uh, information with the people that need it. Um, I also spent 20 years in higher education. So I have a lot of experience with, a lot of people are, are familiar with HIPS, High Impact Educational Practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to the chat GPT conversation here and I'm thinking there needs to be an ethical foundation uh, to all of the systems that we work with. And please, I haven't looked into chat GPT that deeply. I'm looking at the conversation around it and I'm, I'm listening to the dialogue. I'm listening to the concern. I'm listening to the concern specifically about how will students use it? How can faculty use it? How can administrators use it in general? And I'm thinking, okay, let's do a deep dive into the company. Let's do a deep dive into the system. Have they opened their, their system for examination or is it a black box, a proprietary system? Um, so these are all questions that I'm kind of formatting in my mind. Also, the whole, will students use this to plagiarize papers and not do the work? Of course they will. Of course they, of course they will. They're, you know, the traditional age, 18 to 24 years old, they're busy. They don't, they see it at taking classes in general as a means to an end. They just want the grade. They want to get out. They don't, uh, most of them, and I'm making a big generalization, most of them don't see the nuanced uh, benefit to a broadly based undergraduate education, as we do, who are oldsters and have been through the mill. Um, even graduate students, are they're working full time. If they're GAs, they're not making a whole lot of no. money. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. We need to pay attention to this. But high, high impact practices, uh, smaller classes, as Barry mentioned, we need to kind of pare this down and if there's any way we can connect with our students one-on-one -on -one or our small group on one and make that kind of impact I think that will have an effect on you know, showing the students the benefit of doing their own research so I'm here to advocate for ethical AI responsible AI and to really kind of I mean I'm not in the dive in yes this is great I'm not in the ap the apocalyptic I'm kind of Let's see how this turns out. Is it my concern though? I'll just, and I'll wrap it up because I know I'm, there's other people who want to speak. My one concern is that the general public uh, is cottoning to this and feeding all mm -hmm. kinds of personal information into this one mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And with any kind of fad, any kind of trend online, social media, that, you know, the word spreads like wildfire, people really aren't thinking about, hmm, how are they using my data a, on the other side? Are they, am I being monetized? Well, of course we're being monetized, you know, come on. Uh, but how else are they using my data? And is that an area of concern? So I have not even tried chat GPT because I don't want them to have access to my data, even typing in a question. Chat GPT, what do you, what, you know, what color is the sky? Is it blue? Of course it's blue. Well, that, that establishes a connection between me and the system. So these are all questions I think need to be posed to the chat GPT company, but in for higher education as a whole. End of rant. Thank you, Brian. That's not a rant, Carolyn. That's a whole series of great points. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them. We're, by the way, going or aiming to hold a session about AI and libraries uh, within a month or two. Um, all right. Let, let, me, let me keep you both on stage here. And I want to add another person. This is my friend and colleague, uh, Lee Scalera Pissette. And let me see if, uh, if I can beam her in. Hello, Lee. Hey, how you doing? Good. Good to see you. Are you at home? Yeah, I'm in my dark basement. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Stay warm there. Well, yeah, what, what you, actually, you, it's nice and warm. It's raining. Well, stay warm and dry then. How is uh, <laughs> uh how what, what are your thoughts about ChatGPT now? What are you thinking? Oh, by the way, before you say anything in the chat, uh, there's a link to uh, Lee's a tarot uh, list or Zotero page, which has a ton of links there. So I commend you to that. And thank you for yeah, doing. and feel free, as I said, it's a public group. And so you can join the group, you can add resources to it. Um, had a lot of, uh, as I said, DH people add some contextualization around conversations we've been having around a the digital humanists have been having around AI and AI written texts um, for over a decade, uh, if not more. 
um, that we that that uh, that that's going on. But I think, and and I want to echo and, and give credit also. I don't know if Karen's here today, but Karen Costas was bringing up some of these issues in the chat last week that I think are really important around, um, you know, unintended consequences, um, but also ways that it can help uh, traditionally marginalized communities. But also, how might it be used to target? Um, I'm thinking particularly of second language learners. Um, where it can help them produce more fluent texts in English, mm. where they may understand the concepts, they may be able to know them very well, but they are typically penalized for um, writing or even speaking um, in uh, a non-standard English. Um, and even English speakers from different regions and different um, uh, and from different cultural backgrounds. Uh, have traditionally been penalized when we talk about quote unquote standard English and what should be written in what is considered university. And so um, this could be a tool to really help these students uh, communicate in a more quote unquote acceptable level of English where they are communicating mm -hmm. their knowledge in a way that is approved. But in the same time, that could be a, a way of penalizing them and saying, I know you can't write English this well because English is not your first language. And we've seen that, we've seen that generally. We've seen, uh, you know, we've seen that kind of accusation of, uh, before chat GPT, where uh, certain international students or uh, students of different cultural backgrounds, English second language students have been targeted um, and, and accused of cheating or paying essay mills because there's no way your English could be that good. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be, it could be both a tool to really be able to help and overcome some of these biases um, that the students have no control over, but could mm -hmm. also be a way of reinforcing those biases. Another, another thing to think about is the disability community. Um, those who are neurodivergent, um, those who have other kinds of disabilities, like how could we, you know, I think caught or lost in the moral panic is again, not, not just how these tools could be useful to general student population, but to other, as I said, to traditionally marginalized student populations, such as the, uh, among others, the disability community. So how could this start? So like I have ADHD and um, one of the things about ADHD is um, being unable to start. Right. And so could chat GPT be a good tool to help those people with ADHD who have trouble, you know, you say write a paper and you, they need steps, right? You need steps to be able to do that. And not often or not always are those prompts given the steps. And so you could turn to something like chat GPT to get you started. Um, and you eventually write the whole paper, but you just need that little bit of extra help um, that you can't quite articulate. And that again, that's just an example. Um, in this particular case, but you know, there's, there are ways that this tool can bring a tremendous amount of good. Um, you know, and I agree with the whole privacy and all of that, because that could also mean tremendous harm to typically historically surveilled over surveilled populations. Um, but you know, if we can find a way to do it ethically, um, could this tool be used as, um, as a, as a good for again, not just for all students, but particular students who have typically been marginalized and or struggled uh, within within the higher education setting. Good, good observations. Really good observations, Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really like your uh, balanced approach of this uh, targeting people for good or for ill. Um, I, I'd like to just uh, quickly bring in one question that was raised. Uh, and I want to see if the three of you want to want to touch on this. This is from uh, our friend uh, Hossein Hamam, who is out in uh, Beirut, and he couldn't make it live today, but he was really curious about uh, the business case uh, of, of ChatGPT. Uh, and he was really curious to see, among other things, what it would do to the Google advertising market, uh, as well as to advertising in general. Uh, thinking about what happens if you can uh, simply direct ChatGPT to write you some ad copy. I'm just wondering uh, what, what some of your thoughts are on that. Yeah, please, Barry, go ahead. Uh, you're still muted. I'm sorry. I, I muted myself being polite and then couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> it's okay. okay. So, so as far as the use case for copy, like, like that's there, that that's happening. That, that ship has passed, right? If you follow, there's, there's several Twitter feeds that, that people have been talking about. And over the summer, there was this, this article that got written, um, about a researcher 
in, I want to say Denmark, uh, maybe Sweden, and she she had a GP, a chat a GPT write about itself and then post it to peer reviewed journals, right? And with them as the first name and her as the second name and have permission of her, you know, PhD leader. And it got accepted into two, right? What with what we don't really know. Like it got accepted, right? So so that, so I know I talked about two different things there. But um, I think that this idea of, of purchasing time in open AI, like mm -hmm. I think that comes down to the AUP, which speaks to um, you know very much what Caroline, what, what you were talking about as far as like, you know, putting your information in and what do you get out, which some people have that issue with plagiarism checkers, right? Because you are giving over your intellectual property to have your information checked. You're giving over your intellectual property even when you ask a question. And sometimes it's the question that's more potent than the answer exactly. right and so so what we don't know right it's, it's very similar to facebook at the beginning we all got on facebook oh yeah this is great let's talk and we didn't know what metadata was we didn't know what micro data was we didn't know what happened and cambridge analytica came out and we're like oh now i don't want to you know caroline I, I very much have that have that same thought that you do of like where do i want to put my stuff in but let me tell you when you're starting a startup you have to put yourself everywhere. So like my stuff is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I try cleaning myself up and then it's like, man, I gotta be here. All right. So you so, can't yeah, back but, out. You can't no. get out. Once you're in, you're everywhere. I've been using a, a hashtag on my social media. Don't feed the AI beast. And the AI beast is insatiable. The AI beast may seem friendly, but it may be deadly. We don't, we, the thing is, we just don't know. And part of the difficulty and part of the reason we're having this conversation is that we're all kind of smart and a little bit skeptical and we can kind of see around corners and we're kind of imagining a future, a rather dystopian future, unfortunately, where this stuff is, like I said, monetized without our consent or our knowledge used against us and formulating a world as an information professional i realize the change how people search for consume and digest information and share information from let's say 1995 to now back in 1995 people were more likely con to consult print materials because the, the internet was still kind of in its infancy um they were more likely to trust experts they were more likely to share information that they have vetted with their trusted experts. Now, in the era of this magic box, and I'm looking at a screen, it's kind of the great equalizer, but that's a double-edged sword. It's a great equalizer because everybody has information access globally, but the quality of the information, we have access to all kinds of garbage information. And this is the other concern. I mean, what, as educators, we're trying to guide our students to the best quality information, using the best quality resources, you know, showing them how to format and how to cite sources accurately. But if those sources themselves are questionable but don't look questionable, the student is caught is really caught in the middle. So how do we as educators guide our students to not only cite sources and do the whole sort of uh, information literacy, the usual, but also to judge those sources, to track back where is the content coming from, because sometimes it's impossible to know where that content is coming from. That's another big concern of mine. Oh, that really is. And that's, that's quite, I mean, the two of you have offered two, hang on one, one secondly, just quickly, you, you've offered two very, very different responses. The, uh, uh, I mean, Barry, your, your response is, well, it's, it's too late. The barn door is out, the horse is in the next county. Um, we've got to cope with this. And Carolyn, yours is more prophylactic. You want us to not touch the thing. Um, and, not and not touch it, but play with it gently, <laughs> if I could extend the metaphor a little bit. Know what we're getting into. Know that there, well, that there are a lot of unknowns and mm -hmm. have that be kind of okay, but realize that they're, you know, they're very polarizing. And like I said, I'm looking at this with a bit of a jaundiced eye, a bit of a skeptic's stance. And, and really kind of hanging back to see where the conversation is going. Waiting also for the for all the heat to die down on social media. People are like, oh, this is the best thing. And like, let's just play with this and see, mm, okay, y'all play with it. Enjoy. Let's see where it goes. I'm going to give it mm, three months. And then, then we'll, we can right. kind of have a more nuanced conversation about chat GPT. That's right, a long time. Good, good advice. Good thoughts. Uh, Lee, please chime in. 
Well, so, so yeah. I mean, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Lee, no. please, you go ahead, go. And, and my the, the the confluence there is that I also go by Lee in my daily. Oh, so <laughs> I'm kind of like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt in this one, where Lee is my name too. So, so my yes. apologies. Oh yes. my God. Oh, that's that's okay. Okay. What are the chances? AI yeah. driven? Hmm. No, stop that. No, no, no. Uh, no, I, I think that there's. I think that there is. Um, and a, a new there is the nuance to this where, but I think, um, oh, who was it? John Warner said it. And he said, if we teach writing like an algorithm, and then I sort of added the fact the algorithm will always do it better, right? If we're writing ad copy and it's formulaic, the machine will do it better and more efficiently, right? I had it write and about me mm -hmm. and it was completely wrong and it's about me, but it followed the formula of what an about me should sound like, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so this is where, you know, uh, and, and I, it's, it's probably, we, we've likened it to a calculator, but I would almost go as far as saying it's almost like a spreadsheet, right? Where, you know, we don't miss the fact that we don't do those calculations anymore, right? We set up the spreadsheet, it does it for us, right? I don't have to sit Trust there the with my grade book. Yeah, I mean, there's more transparency. We kind of understand, well, some people do. Some people think it's auto magic. I'm, I am I, I hate spreadsheets, so I think that they're like, you know, evil. Um, but, but again, you know, I don't have to manually calculate my grade book anymore. I am happy to pass that off to a machine. Yes. Um, you know, as somebody who writes and who writes a lot, and one of the reasons why people hire me is because I write a lot very well, very quickly and efficiently, yeah. um, but the machine will always do it better than me. No. So, you know, I think in terms of things that follow a certain formula, mm. right? And so then it is, what is the value add that we bring to it if we are creatives yes. in the field of writing? You know, and that's, I think that that goes hmm. for school, but I think for things that are, you know, very formulaic, right? It, it'll it get it yeah. mostly yeah. right. And and I mean, our right. ads are served up alg algorithmically now anyways. I'm going right? to call, like I'm gonna call Barry Lee too. And I know what Lee too <laughs> is about to say when you say yeah. it will always do it better. And I heard him, I saw him go. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But, but again, like it's, it's, you know, we've all seen those weird algorithm ads that it's just like, it knows, you know, again, it's learned from what your metadata is posted. So it's going to make a t-shirt about you being a swim coach mom who actually also does ballet and, and Pilates, right? Like the mismatch to get, you know, get your own sweatshirt or, you know, any of these other ads that are just like, take their name, take their this, take their that. It's like Mad Libs, right? If our advertising copy is already like Mad Libs anyways, well, then this more sophisticated version of Mad Libs is going to probably do it better. Mm. Right. So, you know, I'm I you know, in terms of, you know, I think of its uses outside of higher education as, you know, I think that cat's out of the bag. I think for us mm. within higher education, in terms of the people who study it, with the people who are, are thinking about this, things like intellectual property, stuff like that, I think it's important for us to take that more cautious approach but i also agree that i think outside of higher education where it's like i could pay somebody to write copy or i could pay somebody less just to like scan over the copy chat gpt makes mm -hmm. you know like capitalism is going to win out every time on and that, before lee two like jumps in just to kind of summarize in, in lee one if i could if i could attempt, if i could summarize if i'm oh, looking if i'm looking for ai to help me find a recipe for broccoli cheese soup I'm all over it. Yeah, just, you yeah. know, I, I put yep. in how many people, what kind of cheese, how fresh is the broccoli, done. I, I have a, but I don't want my AI chastising me saying, oh, you're eating too much cheese this week. Wouldn't you just rather have broccoli soup? I'm like, no. <laughs> so, sorry. And, but some people that. do, you know, some people, you know, like that, that's the nudging. Those are the, the, the micro, you know, the micro moves. Yeah. They want nudging. And, when, and that's something in higher education too, right? Where we have the kind of automated reminders, the automated reach outs, the automated. And if chat GPT, I saw in, in this chat, somebody was talking about that. Um, where would chat GPT be something good to help coach students, okay. right? And so like there's there's the both of that. Sorry, go go ahead, Lee. Yeah, so so what Lee too has to say about that 
is, um, you know, from my background. So before I got into instruct, before I got here and I was an instructional designer at a university, but before that, several lives ago, I worked in adult education, helping adults get their GEDs and go to college or, you know, hit their goals. Right. And a big powerful thing inside that is what we call modeling. I think everybody here knows what modeling is, right? You show people what's there. I think that one of the powerful features that chat GPT has is that you're able to say, Hey, I need this. And it starts building it. And you're able to see how those things go together. And one of the things that, that can be interesting from a writing 101 point of view is like, how do you construct these things? Why are the, why did, why did the AI choose these things as paragraphs? Right now that's as a learning tool. Now Lee prime, what I would say to your comment about it being, you know, formulaic, it's 100% formulaic. I'm not saying that it's good. Right. But if you can have a, if you can have somebody who's witty, a copywriter trying to get those one sentence statements and they're just, you know, they're having their riffing, but it's not quite getting where they're going. And they say, Hey, AI, I want 50 statements. And then it starts seeing how the AI starts riffing with it. And they're able to take that and platform to the next space. It's no different than what was it at, at free schools in Australia several years ago, maybe 10 years ago, there was the guy who, who, who led that course on um, cheating. Mm -hmm. And basically the students were not allowed to have an original thought in the course. So everything they had to do had to be begged, borrowed or steal, but then stolen, but then cited where it came from, you know? And so I think that that, that, that spurned a lot of creativity that students didn't realize what, what cheating was, but, but to go back, like, I think that that AI can be that tool that can help unstick people. I think it can assist ESL writers. I think it can assist early learners. The question is like what the instructor wants. If the instructor wants a ghostwriter, right? There's nothing wrong with ghostwriting. Presidents have done it for eons, right? Nothing wrong with ghostwriting. The question is, what do you want in your class? And I think, you know, last time we're talking about the growth that people have with the internal struggle that you have, right? This, this building inside of your schema of what makes good writing of what you're trying to say. And it's that internal argument that helps you refine what you're trying to say. And that's the, that's the important part of writing, right? And so that's the value that, that we're trying to get. So one of my questions is, with AI taking this first pass, what will that evaluation then become? Do we still argue with the AI or do we look at it like a sixth grader with a calculator that the calculator is always right, even though it's garbage in and garbage out? Mm -hmm. This is great. Uh, I, I, I love the original question and how you all wandered far away from it. Um, the, uh, 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 but each of you hit really, really important points. In the, in the chat, there have been a whole bunch of responses, including the fact that you guys are emphasizing process rather than product uh, and as well as the the important difference in uh, human creativity and voice um, and I, this is this is key I, I want to add one more person to the mix uh, this is uh, someone who's coming to us from uh, an extreme time zone uh, compared to us which is uh, Brent Anders who is at the American University of Armenia and was a great panelist last week uh, and let's see if, if Brent is up hello sir hello yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, one, to begin with, I, I think we we really have to understand certain things, um, like the fact that an AI system that can do a whole lot of what ChatGPT is doing right now has been around. It's been around for at least two years. So our students have known this, and they've been using it. So this isn't a fad that's going to go away. It's not uh, a temporary thing. In fact, there's lots of rumors talking about, hey, within a few months, uh -huh. uh, maybe even before the summertime, uh, GPT-4 will come out. Okay. Now, GPT-4 has uh, the potential to be anywhere from 100 to 500 times more powerful and more capable than what ChatGPT is currently using, right? So let that sink in as far as the capabilities and the, 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 what that actually means. So what's really interesting, though, is that when we use the system, yeah, for sure, it's formulaic. I ask it to create a, an essay about democracy. For sure, it's going to use, you know, basically five paragraphs, and here you go. Uh, but then the coolness of it and the, the power of it is then I can tell ChatGPT, hey, I, I like what you did there, but uh, change this. Give me another version. Make it uh, more emotional. Make it uh, in this way. Make it the way uh, Albert Einstein would, would say it. Make it the way uh, this other person would say it. And it'll modify it as many times as you want. So that kind of brings me into this next part. And this is what I'm struggling with because I recently sort of thought about our last session with ChatGPT 
Mm -hmm. And then I thought about, well, what do we say right now as far as plagiarism within our policy at the university? And in there, it talks specifically about, oh, it's plagiarism if you're claiming someone else's, some other person's work as your own. Okay, well, there's a problem right there, right? Uh, Chat GPT or AI isn't a person. So basically, according to the policy, that's not plagiarism. But of course it is, right? Because it's someone, some other entity's work. But then that brings in this other question, right? So here is Chat GPT. I, let's say I create a document. Here's my rough draft. And my instructor looks at it and says, yeah, you need to do these things. Okay, so I take that, my rough draft, and I feed it into Chat GPT. And then now I tell it, hey, give me feedback. And then I say, okay, implement that feedback. Uh, change it so that it's uh, more direct because my instructor told me that. So now it's creating these other iterative, iterative forms based off of my rough draft. But now is it still mine? Can I just claim me? Or now should I say, no, it's co-authored by Chat GPT. Really, is it? Because what is Grammarly doing for us? Well, Grammarly does quite a bit. And if you get Grammarly Premium, which is using even more AI in it as well, it can paraphrase an entire sentence for you. So it's creating another version of a sentence for you. So now is that AI? Do I need to say, oh, Grammarly also helped me? So you see how it's really starting to get this gray area starting to really grow as far as the ethical aspects of what we're saying with you know, who's doing it and who has full ownership. So it becomes a really an interesting part but one more thing, one more thing is that I really think that we have to realize that this is our new reality. And if we're not incorporating these tools and these capabilities into the classroom, we're going to be doing a disservice to the students because you go out into business, the, you know, you were talking about copyright right now. Oh yeah, that's all done with AI. And it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a factor of we still need to have people to look at that, 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 uh, that content and to say, oh, that's good or that's bad. But the reality is now, instead of saying, okay, you have a week to do this content, this copyright, uh, no, you have, a, you have a day to do it and you're gonna need to do 20 of them. Whereas before I'd give you a week. So now you have to use that AI. That's required of you, you have to have that skill. And many, many of the different uh, 21st century skills that are being pushed are saying that, hey, if you wanna be competitive in the job market, you need to know how to properly work with AI because that's just a new reality. I mean, it's business. Absolutely. And may I, I have a couple of comments. Brent, you're brilliant. That was amazing. That was that was just so cool. Um, so I dropped a, a big theoretical conceptual universal question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Is chat is chat GPT a tool or is it an entity? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if we are citing chat GPT or any other system as a co-author or a primary author, for God's sake, it becomes an entity on its own. And then in this era of digital twins and legal rights, okay, if chat GPT becomes a primary author, are they entitled to compensation? Do we invite them to a conference to speak? Uh, you know, do we want to work? I, so I also work a lot with um, open science and the various flavors of open science. And one uh, emerging sort of a 2.0 of open science is open methods. Uh -huh. And so open methodology talks about declaring how you're going to do an experiment, how you're going to do your, your science, what your hypothesis is ahead of time before you publish. And part of that, and it occurs to me that in the area of disclosure, we may see more and more higher ed entities and other organizations requiring that if you use something like chat GPT, you must disclose that you use this. I write. I wrote this paper with the chat GPT tool, system, whatever entity, so that people will know that there is that flavor or that support going on underneath. Um, so the other thing I wanted to, to mention is that whether it's chat GPT or any other tool, the rate of change, you, Brent, you mentioned version four is coming out in just a couple of months. The rate of change, the rate of update, the rate of development has increased exponentially. So things are changing faster on a technology level, faster than any of us can even comprehend, let alone keep up with. 
And so that just adds to the challenge of us sort of working in this space. And we continue to have conversations like this because the new version is going to come out and it's going to have a twist on things that we didn't even expect. So we also, we this is another reason why I'm kind of the hang back and be skeptical crowd is it's, I don't, I can't formulate an opinion right now because in 12 weeks it's going to be completely different. So I'd rather just kind of take a breather and look at the bigger picture. Thank you, Brent. That was, I loved your comments. Yeah, no, I mean, I I want to do that too. It's just, it's going to change so quickly that uh, like one of the big things that they're talking about for 2023 is this idea that everything is going to be super apps, right? So you're not going to have so many different apps. Everything is going to be put together. Uh, even Google right now is talking about how, hey, all these different things that can go, uh, you know, text to, to, to image, text to video, they're going to be incorporating all those things. So you're going to have one system like a, a super chat GPT where you could tell it everything. Hey, make me a video about this. Make, make me uh, images about this and incorporate text and put it all together in a website. I mean, there's so many different things that are going to be coming together uh, that it's just going to be so phenomenal that, uh, you know, and, and I really uh, like what you were talking about as far as having to to say, well, we use chat GPT for this. I think that 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 is something that in the interim will be there. But I, I foresee a future, a very near future where it's going to be. What do you mean? What, why are you telling us that you did this? Of course you did it. Like you'd yeah. have to say you'd have to say, no, I didn't use it because it, it's already. Yeah, yeah I mean. Exactly. Like, no, nobody exactly. here. Nobody here is citing that they're using I see this being integrated with Microsoft Word as well. Like, why would right. Microsoft Word have this in there already? Right. Uh, if they want to be competitive, and they kind of do already. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's a better like Clippy. Well, I see you're writing a letter. Would you, you like some help? Thank you. It's yeah, a much yeah. better Clippy that we all hated back in the day, but now might actually be useful. But I, but I think that this this whole idea as well, and and this is. You know, so there's writing classes and we want to teach students how to write, but mostly how to communicate their thinking. And then I'm thinking of disciplinary classes where the essay has typically been the way that students have communicated their thinking. Now, there's a move away from that in terms of project based learning, in terms of all different kinds of multimedia uh, sorts of thing. But I, but one of the things I was thinking of is that. I want to know what basically as an instructor, and maybe people disagree, is that I want to know that you've learned the material, you've met the learning outcomes, which is typically, you know, whatever discipline specific thing that they want to, that they that the students can demonstrate. They want the students to demonstrate that you can do X, Y, or Z, or understand, or, you know, I'm, I'm really massacring Bloom's taxonomy here, but that, give me a sec. So if chat GPT the way it is now, and maybe five will be better, um, and I won't have to do as much coaching. But like you said, at the moment, ChatGPT takes a lot of coaching from you. It's like, that's only five yeah. paragraphs. I need you to expand that. That, you know, you just made that up. Get rid of that paragraph. Here, read this article on the topic and learn about it. And if I'm coaching ChatGPT through the process and I decide as the student, this now is... You know, I have to have an understanding of the subject matter in order to coach chat GPT to write a good paper on that subject matter. So am I not meeting the learning outcome, which is to demonstrate knowledge? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I think that that's, you know, I, I think that that's something that we don't think about either. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it gets us thinking, or how are we assessing students? Why are we assessing students the way they do? Why is the essay, particularly in humanistic and even social science disciplines, the main way? Um, because again, maybe this maybe this point is moot in two iterations because you don't have to coach it anymore. But at the moment, that coaching reflects a knowledge of the subject matter to be able to right. say to it, you know, that's wrong. This is right. You need to go deeper here. You know, and is that get, gonna get be a better quote important. than that one. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. That, exactly. That's, that's when we question. talk about information literacy, yeah. like which skill are we now we going? Is that right. I can discern and maybe I'm doing a better job than my, you know, than my classmates who wrote their own paper. I'm fascinated. Well, well, you, know, so wow. you bring up a great point because like 
So uh, I'm in another country right now, Armenia, and they're going through a major shift in the development of uh, their educational process here. They're still very much focused on students here because I have two children that, you know, one's in high school, one's in middle school. They're very much focused on you have to memorize information and then be able to regurgitate it. Right. Mm. That's exactly how the United States was maybe 30 years ago. Uh, but they're still that and they're still developing away from that because it doesn't make any sense. Like we don't need to memorize everything. We have Google for that. We have all these different. We, what we need is critical thinking to be able to actually use it and then create content based off of that. But now it seems like we're moving beyond that. We don't have to create the content. We have to properly guide the formation of it and understand that it's being done in the right way. So there's this critical thinking that's still going to be super important. Um, Barry, I'm interested. Is it like in what... raising children? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm interested, Barry, in what you have to say about this as far as the detection software incorporating that or looking at different aspects of that. Well, so one of the things that one, one of the reasons why I started this startup is because our our tool is working in a, in a way that's different. I, I feel that um, that that plagiarism detection tools that are on the market um, mm -hmm. currently are are antagonistic. I don't believe that they value the, the learner, what the learner has, that, that they're working in a way of like a gotcha way, right? Even e proctoring. So what we've done with our AI is is different. Um, my background is adult ed, so I think more in an andragogical process, and I want to know what that learner is bringing to the table. And so we're working on creating something that is more student first, uh, a, a concept that I learned early on in talking with some people at East Anglia University in England. And what they were talking about is this idea of like, okay, sure, this is going to stop. This is going to stop ghostwriting, um, and that's. But but how does it benefit the student? And so, so, so we're working on that. But, but what we see as our, as our beginning is that what we're asking is the student submits their paper like they would to a Turnitin submission. Mm. But then our AI is reading their paper and asking them questions based off their writing style, their content, and their memory. So it's not about like what they've learned, but it's about how they wrote and their writing choices. And we feel that that is more accurate, a more accurate reflection of, of what we want to get to, right? Like, like again, ghostwriting has happened for eons. People aren't worried about ghostwriting right now. They're not, I mean, like ghostwriting, any university has a ghostwriting issue. Lee, uh, Lee Prime, would you say that, that you have instructors asking, you know, feeling like that ghostwriting is happening in their classroom? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're, they're worried about it. That's for sure. Well, um, you know, and, and, you know, we have, we, we have our honor council. We have, I mean, cheating has been, an issue at universities, um, you know, since time immemorial, right? Like, well, right. I mean, but I mean, but we've also changed our view of it because we've gotten a lot more sophisticated. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, and so, but I can remember, you know, pre-internet, um, pe uh, people talking about how there was a filing cabinet in the frat houses still that there. had everybody's papers. Yeah, now they're Dropbox folders, I'm sure. But like that right. they, you know, that they, it was, okay, you have this professor, let's find our brother who, who wrote an A paper for that class. Here it is, right? Um, you know, it, it, this, this has been around before the internet. It's just, we now have created more sophisticated, to use the term that John used last week, we've, we've got way more sophisticated cop shit. Yeah. Um, while never addressing the actual underlying issues um, that has led, you know, it's easier to uh, get the university to pay for cop shit than it is to um, change the pedagogy. And if I may, we're uh, treating this as a whack-a-mole game. We keep chasing yeah, exactly. after we've got to squash X technology. We've got to squash X plagiarism, whatever. We've got to squash, 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 squash instead of addressing the overarching issue of why students are doing this and what what is feeding the motivation for them doing this and do we need to maybe rethink some of our own policies and our own learning outcomes to really yes. shape what's going on in the classroom so that okay we're, we can stop playing whack-a-mole and get to actual learning yeah correct 
I mean, but but that's also the goal of writing, right? I mean, like I think all of us were inside of this movement away, of the move away from stage on the stage to guide on the side. Mm -hmm. You know how many times we've been talking about rubrics, but then rubrics that are personalized. So you're able to then you know go into the system and, and make it to this paper, right? And but all of that that we've talked about, I mean, all of that is formulaic, isn't it? I mean, how many times do we see a rubric? That is just, you know, four by four or five by four. It's all from novice to, to whatever, right? It's like, it, it's same, same, but different, right? So, so the question is, how do we make it more nuanced? And, and I think that that's where we're going. Um, I do want to go back to, to a point, Brett, that you were talking about is this idea of like, do we need to be asking permission to be quoting the AI? And I think that that ship is right about the station as well, because plagiarism is not the same thing as ghostwriting. Hmm. And that's which comes back to my my central argument, right? Again, looking yeah. at my tool, it's it's like a lot of a lot of schools have things in place for plagiarism, but a lot of schools do not have things in place for when students are working with essay mills, when okay. students are using that fifty bucks to their yeah. peer, when students are doing these other things. That's a lot more nuanced and a lot more difficult, and that's the issue that that's happening here. Again, if the instructor wants it, it doesn't matter, but the question is, when are people using it? and not getting that the background information that's more relevant that the instructor is wanting them to take away. I, I hate to intervene here uh, because you guys are just brilliant. Um, this is great, but I'm, I'm conscious of time and that we only have four minutes left. Um, I want to uh, ask a couple of procedural things. Uh, first, uh, folks in the chat, as well as folks who have asked questions uh, in the uh, chat in the uh, question box, do you mind if I copy these, anonymize these and post them to uh, my blog? Just let me know in the chat, uh, and uh, I'll be I'll be I'll be delighted to do that along with the recording. Uh, the uh, there are a bunch of questions uh, that have that have been pouring in, and I'm trying to pick one that I can ask you all uh, that will actually try to uh, sum things up. Um, and that is, if you could um, right now, if you could advise a college or university what to do about this, either in Carolyn's memorable phrase to whack that mole. Um, or how to do this structurally, what would your advice be? And I'd, I'd like to give each of you about 45 seconds to, uh, to, to give a whack at that. Um, Mine will be super quick. Please, go ahead. Get rid of grades. So ungrading, okay. Ungrading. Well, because yes, ungrading get rid of grades. has, has Come grading up at with, the end. I mean, right? it, with, with ungrading, yeah. the professor still has to put yeah. something into you know, the, the grade book yep. at the end. So, mm -hmm. so that, that doesn't cure that point. problem. Good point. And so, and this goes back yep. to Carolyn's Get rid of grades. observation about the overarching issue of what drives students to do this. So we'll just take away one of those drivers right there. Thank you, Lee, Lee Prime. I'd, I'd, I'd like to go next. Uh, something that I've seen actually quite helpful. I don't know if this will work with the big tier one universities with thousands and thousands of students, but to actually host a university town hall not just for chat mm -hmm. GPT, but when these mm -hmm. sticky problems, these sticky issues that we're grappling with that directly affect students, it affects pedagogy, it affects classroom management, all of that, is to host a town hall, invite everybody, and invite, have an open dialogue about, okay, here's the latest issue, whether it's COVID or, you know, back on campus or chat GPT or the next thing. I'd like, I'm always a fan of hearing student voices about this. I want it, I would want to hear their concerns. I would want to hear their potential solutions and really take what they say seriously and maybe incorporate that and make some changes, but at least have the, this conversation out in the open on an institutional level. I love this idea. I love both of these ideas and I'd be, I'd be glad to help host and, and support those. Thank you, Carla. So uh, for my response, I would love for, for, for us to be at that level, right? I'm st I'm a, I also work uh, as the director for Center for Teaching and Learning, and I would love for our instructors to be at that level of AI literacy to even realize that this is really going on, right? I, I can guarantee you that a majority of your students know about ChatGPT, or that they've already been using some other of the many AI creation uh, software that's out there to be creating writing already. So I would love to be able to push this and say, hey, this is a mandated thing that you need to know about, that you need to incorporate, that you need to start to push this understanding of AI literacy for both instructors and students because this is the new reality. 
So pushing that, having that be incorporated in the overall process of doing things so that the instructor knows that it can't just be thinking that, oh, this essay is going to be the, my assessment. Well, it doesn't really assess anything if they're just using a software to create it. So there has to be this more understanding of how are we truly gauging if the student is gaining all the student learning outcomes that they're supposed to within the course. Wow, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Barry slash Lee Secondary. Yeah. So, I mean, my response is that, uh, you know, early on, the, the article that came out in higher ed, uh, the, 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 well, the idea was just that listen to your students, know your students, have that community, right? We're trying to build community. If you are at such a scale that you, that community is not working for you and talking about these hard concepts with your students, then look at the tools that can help. I feel that my tool off plus is one of those shifts. And I would like to be able to share with anybody who's interested. We're, we're an early stage startup. We're trying to work with teachers, trying to work with professors, anybody that wants to enable this in their class, please feel free to reach out to me. The whole idea is that we are taking the cross questioning for you. And again, asking those students, Thanks. asking those students writing specific questions, not, not content specific questions Thank you. to be able Karen, to help that lift. Uh, Barry, Carolyn, Brent, Lee, you were fantastic. Um, you were facilitator's dream. I had to do almost nothing except reluctantly stop you all. Um, could you could you please in the chat, just to the extent you were interested, toss your contact info in the chat, including Barry, the uh, link to your uh, to your new firm. Uh, I, I have to wrap things up, but I do that only with great regret. Thank you so much, uh, Barry and Carolyn. Uh, I love how you each represented so many different uh, points of view and so many different perspectives. Uh, this has been this has been terrific, and I thank everybody uh, for your thoughts. The uh, chat, um, Wesson and I are re are recording the chat and the uh, uh, and the questions so that we can post them up. Uh, thank you all for another brilliant discussion of this amazingly challenging and interesting topic uh, with a great deal of importance. Um, we should return to this uh, in the new year. In the meantime, if you'd like to keep talking about this, you'll note here that in my slide that I've added something. Uh, please use the hashtag FTTE wherever you are. Uh, on Twitter, I'm still active there. Um, and also on Mastodon, that's the best way to find me there on Mastodon. And on my blog, uh, we've had several posts there and more are coming up too. Uh, if you'd like to go into our previous session, as well as our earlier sessions about writing and about uh, plagiarism and cheating, academic integrity, and so on, just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. You can go through those. Uh, we have a whole bunch of sessions coming up. Um, please you know, go to Forum, the Future of Education, the U.S., to sign up for more. And uh, if you'd like to share any of your work, including any of your adventures with ChatGPT, email me. I'd be glad to share them with the world. I'm very proud of all of you in this community. And I'm delighted, delighted to spread the word. Uh, in the meantime, sorry we went over a couple of minutes, but this was all good. This is all excellent. Thank you all for this. Uh, we're coming close to the end of the year. We have one more session next week, which will be very lighthearted. Between now and then, wherever you are, stay safe. Enjoy some downtime if you can. It's been a pleasure being with you all. Take care, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.